In this video, I want to look at what is arguably one of Ibn Taymiyyah's most controversial views. In his last work, he appears to argue for universal salvation, i.e. that everyone, without exception, will go to paradise. And to look at this further, I want to read a few words from this excellent book, Ibn Taymiyyah, by Professor John Hoover professor of Islamic studies at the University of Nottingham. He's acknowledged as one of the world experts on the thought and life of Ibn Taymiyyah. And in this book on page 137, in a section entitled The Ultimate Destiny of Unbelievers, he discusses uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's views on the ultimate destiny of mankind. John Hoover writes, Ibn Taymiyyah is totally unsympathetic to religions apart from Islam, and he is in no doubt that unbelievers will suffer punishment in hellfire in the hereafter. However, late in his life he came to the conclusion that this punishment would not last forever. Sometime during Ibn Taymiyyah's last imprisonment in Damascus, his student, Ibn Qayyim asked him twice about the chastisement of unbelievers in hellfire. The first time, Ibn Taymiyyah refused to answer. He would, not, he would only say that it was a difficult question, and it appears that he did not yet know what to think. The second time, Ibn Qayyim sent his teacher a book containing a statement by Umar ibn al-Khattab, a companion of the Prophet Muhammad. The statement read, even if the people of the fire stayed in the fire like the amount of sand in Alij, they would have, despite that, a day in which they would come out. Alij was a large tract of sand on the way to Mecca. Ibn Taymiyyah responded with what appears to be his last work, a short treatise entitled Refutation of Whoever Adheres to the annihilation of paradise and hellfire. In this treatise, Ibn Taymiyyah argues that it is incorrect to say that both paradise and hellfire will be eliminated or annihilated. That was the view of an eccentric theologian from the second century of Islam. Instead, explains Ibn Taymiyyah, the reward of paradise is everlasting while the chastisement of unbelievers in hellfire will end. Umar ibn al-Khattab's statement elucidates the Quran, which says that those in hell will be in it for long stretches of time. That's Surah 78, 23. The expression long stretches of time does not mean forever. A time will come then when everyone will come out. Most other Muslim scholars of Ibn Taymiyyah's day maintained that unbelievers would remain in hellfire forever. The Quran says in many places that unbelievers will be in hellfire abiding therein forever. For example, chapter 4, verse 169 reads as follows. I'm going to read it in Abd al-Halim's modern English translation. It goes... God will not forgive those who have disbelieved and do evil, nor will he guide them to any path except that of hell, where they will remain forever. This is easy for God. It was also claimed that a consensus had been reached on this point. The Muslim scholars had come to agreement that unbelievers would remain in hellfire forever with no end to their chastisement. There was also no disagreement among the earliest Muslim generations, the Salaf, over this matter. Ibn Taymiyyah responds that the Quranic terms abiding and forever should not be taken in their absolute senses. They do not preclude an eventual end to the punishment of unbelievers. He also rejects the alleged consensus around everlasting hellfire. There was no consensus for this among the companions, as the statement from the companion Umar ibn al-Khattab, quoted above, illustrates. Additionally, 
As mentioned in chapter five in this book, Ibn Taymiyyah does not accept a later consensus as binding because it is too difficult to verify. Broader theological considerations also play a role in Ibn Taymiyyah's argument. It follows from God's mercy and forgiveness that the blessings of paradise will last forever, but everlasting chastisement does not follow from any of God's names and attributes. Also, God's mercy precludes chastisement without end. The Quran says, God has written mercy for himself, 6.12. And a hadith reads, my mercy precedes my anger. Finally, Ibn Taymiyyah appeals to God's wise purpose. God's wise purpose in chastisement is cleansing from sins and purifying souls, he explains. Therefore, there could be no wise purpose in chastising someone forever. The implication of Ibn Taymiyyah's argument is universal salvation. Now, in my view, this means that the Hitlers, the Stalins, the persecutors, the evildoers of this world will ultimately all go to paradise. I think that's the logic of Ibn Taymiyyah's argument. Back to John Hoover. He says he makes clear that God's wise purpose in chastisement and punishment is reform and not retribution. Retribution mets out reward and punishment in due proportion to human deeds. The mainstream Sunni tradition maintained that the just retribution for unbelief was eternal hellfire. From Ibn Taymiyyah's perspective, however, everlasting punishment would defeat God's wise purpose of purifying souls towards a higher end. Hellfire fits neatly into Ibn Taymiyyah's purpose-driven theology as an instrument of therapeutic discipline. I like John Hoover's expression, therapeutic discipline. Although Ibn Taymiyyah does not say so explicitly, his reasoning leads to the conclusion that God will use hellfire to bring all creatures into complete accord with the purposes for which they were naturally constituted and through which they will attain the greatest benefit. Everyone will eventually worship God alone. For Ibn Taymiyyah, the ethic of both God and humanity is utilitarianism in the service of religion. Humans in an imperfect world should weigh up benefits and detriments in seeking what best, what best promotes the religious law. Likewise, God creates and commands to maximise human benefit to the extent possible through correct worship. Ibn Taymiyyah's God is a cosmic utilitarian who generates the greatest benefit possible for the greatest number. Simultaneously, this God elicits the worship, love and praise that he alone is due. As we saw in chapter 7, God does not elicit human praise and love out of need. Nothing can add to God's immeasurably greater praise and love of himself. Ibn Taymiyyah's thought overall gives priority to ethics and worship as obedience to God's law. Ibn Taymiyyah now reaches his conclusion. That Ibn Taymiyyah, John Hoover, I should say, reaches his conclusion. That law includes speaking well of God and God's ways with humanity in order to render God due praise. Theology for Ibn Taymiyyah is not a theoretical endeavour, but a practical exercise directed towards obedience and worship. I think it's a really important insight here that John Hoover stresses. Read that again. Theology for Ibn Taymiyyah is not a theoretical endeavour. It's not an ivory tower pursuit. It's a practical exercise directed towards the worship and obedience of God. It's a very practical theology. 
John Huber concludes, the whole of his intellectual project is a juristic enterprise devoted to delineating and rationalizing the correct way to worship God. And that's the end of that section. Now, I did discuss this theme with a, a friend of mine who is a, a big fan of Ibn Taymiyyah. And it appears to be the case that modern followers in today's world of, of Ibn Taymiyyah actually disagree with Ibn Taymiyyah on this point. They think he was wrong, actually. It's not as if Salafis, for example, follow Ibn Taymiyyah slavishly and what he said and believed on everything. They don't. So there seems to be a pretty universal consensus amongst uh, the majority Sunni theologians uh, throughout history and um, modern followers and supporters of Ibn Taymiyyah that he was just wrong on this. Wrong in the sense that Islam, the Quran, the Sunnah, the Hadith require universal salvation. That doesn't seem to be the teaching of the Quran. Um, I quoted the verse, of course, which seems very clear. God will not forgive those who have disbelieved and do evil, nor will he guide them to any path except that of hell, where they will remain forever. This is easy for God. That's the fourth surah, verse 168 and 169. So the Quran is clear, it seems to me, uh, and Ibn Taymiyyah is wrong. Uh, that would seem to be the near universal census of modern followers and supporters of Ibn Taymiyyah's thought, as well as everyone else, the Sunni position in general. So um, I think that's a useful corrective that uh, this book brings to bear, both in a more nuanced understanding of exactly what Ibn Taymiyyah thought, and also it brings out his mistaken notions, if he was wrong, uh, in theology as well. So um, I think that's particularly interesting. I hope that was uh, enjoyable. Till next time.